Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session of the National Cancer Policy Forum's workshop on cancer care and cancer research in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, Lessons Learned. This session is a roundtable discussion on telehealth and cancer care and cancer clinical research. I'm Dr. Karen Knudsen, CEO of the American Cancer Society and the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I have the honor of co-moderating this session with Dr. Nekhludov, professor, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. We will begin with a keynote from Dr. Michael Kelly, professor of medicine at Duke University and chief of hematology oncology at Durham's VA Medical Center, as well as national program director for oncology at the Department of Veterans Affairs. We will then hear from eight discussants. Dr. Robin Zahn, who is immediate past president of the Michiana Hematology Oncology and co-chair of the ASCO Telehealth Expert Panel. Dr. Inga Lennis, a senior vice president for practice improvement and patient experience at the Mass General Hospital Cancer Center and Mass General Physicians Organization. Dr. Paul Jacobson, an associate director of healthcare delivery research at the National Cancer Institute. Dr. William Dayhut, Scientific Director for Clinical Research, the Center for Cancer Research, and Clinical Director at the National Cancer Institute. We'll have a Food and Drug Administration perspective from Leonard Sachs, Associate Director for Clinical Methodology in the FDA Office of Medical Policy. We'll hear from Dr. Lee Flesher, Chief Medical Officer and Director of the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And finally, Dr. Michael McNeely, Director of the Office of Advancement of Telehealth at the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy at the Health Services and at the Health Resources and Services Administration. Please note that all bios are available in the briefing book and are posted on the workshop website. And just a few more reminders before we get going. The presentations have been pre-recorded and will play consecutively. After the last presentation, we will begin the live panel discussion, but you don't have to wait for that moment to go ahead and upload your questions. We encourage your involvement in the workshop, so please use that chat box on our website to ask questions and we'll get to you. Thank you so much and let's start the presentations. Hello, my name is Michael Kelly and I wanted to start by expressing my appreciation for the invitation to present uh, at this workshop on behalf of the many colleagues and partners uh, who work on VA tele-oncology and decentralized clinical trials. VA is the largest uh, integrated healthcare system in the country with about 9 million enrolled veterans uh, and about nine, uh, 6 million uh, healthcare users. Uh, there are about 50,000 new cancer diagnoses each year uh, with the demographics and cancer types as shown on uh, the slide here. Importantly for today's talk, about a third of enrolled veterans live in rural areas uh, which is about two and a half times the national rate of rurality. VA is committed to implementing an oncology system of excellence. A uh, component of that system is the National Tele-Oncology Service that was, lost, that was launched last year in 2020, uh, and it uh, evolved from the Durham Tele-Oncology uh, Service, which began in 2018. So VA National Tele-Oncology Service uh, seeks to realign the supply and demand uh, for oncologists uh, with a primary goal uh, to improve access to care for veterans with cancer, including uh, improving timeliness of cancer care. So VA has very well-developed telehealth resources, including national services for radiology, genetic counseling, and ICU services. Uh, the model is a virtual cancer center, which is analogous to an NCI-designated cancer center. Uh, in which the providers have specialization in the patient's cancer type uh, and are engaged in academic activities such as clinical research. Uh, we also want to improve the efficiency and precision of clinical practice. Uh, and the initial focus is on medical oncology in the context of multidisciplinary care. And our target service areas are primarily smaller VA medical centers uh, with some activity in other types of VA uh, bricks and mortar uh, facilities such as uh, medical clinics uh, and also outside of VA. So the model for the VA National Tele-Oncology Service is shown on the slide. Uh, in addition to the subspecialized oncologist, uh, the virtual hub has a number of other clinical roles. Uh, not shown are a palliative uh, care provider, uh, virtual tumor boards, and uh, non-clinical support staff. 
the primary patient site is a clinic with inf uh, an infusion on site uh, where the patient is, mostly uh, located at smaller VA medical centers. Uh, an on-site advanced practice provider is a requirement for comprehensive infusional services. Uh, we use uh, non-VA care for services that are not available within the VA uh, at the patient site, such as radiation oncology, uh, surgical subspecialists, and some radiology services. Uh, so this map shows the location of the nine activated patient care sites and eight additional sites that are in the process of being activated. So I want to switch now to decentralized clinical trials. Uh, this uh, slide shows a model that was described by um, Sean uh, Kozin and um, Andy uh, Karavos uh, about where uh, data is uh, generated and where it's collected. And as we move uh, more towards uh, remote locations for uh, the locality of where the data are captured, uh, we move into this era of decentralized clinical trials. Uh, so compared to, to traditional site-based trials, uh, decentralized trials are um, less uh, costly. They have higher re uh, recruitment and retention rates. Uh, the participants can be more diverse, uh, and therefore the results can, of the clinical trial can be more clinically uh, applicable. Um, and also, uh, you can integrate uh, digital tools uh, more extensively in the decentralized fashions. There are some uh, limitations to the decentralized clinical trials, uh, in particular, uh, if you're uh, obtaining uh, research biopsies or biosampling, such as in pharmacokinetic studies, uh, that usually is uh, a significant challenge for a decentralized model, um, although you can obtain some samples. Um, and then the other two uh, limitations are registration studies and those that do not qualify for FDA waivers uh, are not appropriate for this model. Uh, this is uh, how we would modify the teleoncology service uh, to account for uh, virtual clinical trials. Uh, so the principal investigator and the clinical trial staff become a component of the teleoncology service. Uh, and then the patient sites are now uh, more extensive than the list I showed you. Uh, it might include all of the sites uh, within VA, uh, which is about 130 practice sites for oncology and maybe even out to the uh, approximately 1,000 uh, clinics that are present so that uh, when a patient is identified, uh, and is eligible or potentially eligible for a clinical study, they are referred uh, to the trial in the context of teleoncology, uh, where they're then uh, connected with the, the clinical uh, research staff. So we have two um, projects that are ongoing to sort of establish the feasibility of this. So one is a phase four study, which is looking at a number of endpoints uh, in patients who are being treated with uh, a immune checkpoint inhibitor for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the endpoints include efficacy endpoints, toxicity, and patient-reported outcomes. And all these patients are located across the country. Uh, the second study is uh, designed for uh, the intent of uh, establishing proof of concept in a relationship with a commercial partner. Um, the patient population are metastatic prostate cancer and metastatic now small cell lung carcinoma. Uh, the patients undergo identification through the medical record system, uh, and then there's uh, an attempt to uh, recruit and enroll them in the study. Uh, the patients uh, fill, do an e-consent. Uh, they complete a questionnaire and are trained on the technology and the wearable. Uh, and then they undergo follow-up over a period of six months uh, to collect uh, medical record and wearable data and a patient-reported outcome at four, uh, at, uh, four different visits. And uh, then there's an exit uh, questionnaire at the end for both the patient and the healthcare provider. Uh, so shifting to the last uh, topic I'm going to talk about, which is the impact of COVID on uh, cancer care and VA. So first, this slide just shows the overall impact of uh, COVID on uh, the use of telehealth in the VA for any uh, type of disease. Uh, this is uh, all video telehealth, so it increased uh, about sevenfold in terms of the number of visits. Um, and has continued at that level uh, since the uh, pandemic. Uh, the number of uh, visits per patient increased from about one and a half to about two and a half. For oncology uh, patients, uh, the use of video telehealth uh, increased about fivefold in both the number of patients and the number of uh, visits. Uh, and that uh, left the, the uh, ratio of visits to patients uh, stable at about 1.2. And again, you see stability uh, at the tail end of the uh, data. 
Uh, cancer screening rates did decline uh, in VA modestly, um, they, about 3 to 5 percent for cervical, breast, and uh, colorectal cancer, as shown on this slide. Uh, however, there is some additional complexity to the data. Uh, so for colorectal cancer, there was a, a sharp acute decline in colonoscopy in March of 2018. Uh, it has recovered to about 91 percent of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, while screening colonoscopy declined markedly, uh, FIT testing uh, was much more stable. Uh, the number of ordered FIT tests actually increased. Uh, the number of resulted FIT tests decreased about 7 percent, uh, but follow-up from the pandemic era cohort is not yet mature, uh, as, at least not as mature as the uh, pre-cohort level. Uh, and finally, uh, the treatment of active cancer appears to have uh, continued mostly unabated during the uh, pandemic. Uh, this slide shows uh, the stable use of uh, 10 different anti-cancer medications. Uh, there's similar data uh, for radiation and surgery. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to share uh, the VA experience with you, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Hello, and welcome to this roundtable discussion where I will be providing the oncology clinician perspective on telehealth and cancer care and research. My name is Robin Zahn, and I'm a medical oncologist providing full-time patient care with Michiana Hematology Oncology Cancer Specialists, a Midwest U.S. practice based in North Central and Northwest Indiana. My practice is an independent community oncology practice, and we provide outpatient care services in medical oncology, radiation oncology, radiology, IV infusion, and oral pharmacy and I have no relevant disclosures. Similar to most oncology practices in the United States, my practice utilized teletechnology less than 1% of the time pre-pandemic due to a number of factors, including but not limited to lack of technology access, lack of education providers and patients on implementation of this technology, lack of public and private payer allowances to cover all oncology populations, and lack of consideration of telemedicine as an essential part of cancer care management services. The American Society of Clinical Oncology, the world's largest professional oncology society, otherwise known as ASCO, responded to the needs of its members as published in the following articles once the pandemic arrived. As a consequence of restrictions imposed, the utilization of telehealth oncology drastically increased variably, and for some clinicians, use was highly used for non-infusion visits. The reports included a guide to cancer care delivery during the COVID-19 pandemic, published in the summer of 2020 and updated in December of 2020. The Road to Recovery Report, Learning from the COVID-19 Experience to Improve Clinical Research in Cancer Care, and two interim position statements, Telemedicine and Cancer Care and Telemedicine Cross-State Licensure. Out of the interest of time, this slide highlights some of ASCO's recommendations regarding telehealth in response to member concerns. I would refer you to the prior slide for the references for a more detailed discussion in exact language. And these recommendations would include ASCO supports the flexibility CMS has implemented to ensure telemedicine is available to more practitioners and patients during the COVID-19 public health emergency and urges CMS to maintain these expanded telemedicine policies beyond the pandemic. State and federal policymakers should make permanent and adequate reimbursement for all modes of telemedicine delivery by all plans and payers. Federal and state governments should promote universal access to high-speed broadband through expanding digital infrastructure Federal and state governments should work to promote health equity through encouraging use of telemedicine in all care settings, including but not limited to rural and safety net providers. State and federal policies permitting telemedicine to cross state lines should include provision requiring doctor-patient relationships be established prior to provision of any telemedicine service. Medical liability providers should include telemedicine and data security related risks in their policies and physicians should verify medical liability comprehensive coverage for telemedicine services, including across state lines in which they practice. And all states should participate in the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, and lawmakers should enact legislation to join. In addition to the publications and recommendations discussed on the prior slides, the ASCO Quality of Care Council established an expert panel 
which was tasked with developing evidence-based standards to assure appropriate methods of organizational care for oncology practices, healthcare practitioners, patients, and caregivers. On the left side of the slide, this is my co-chair, Dr. Ray Page, and the other members of the expert panel, which included a patient representative, physician assistant, and oncologists from both academia and community practices. The topics addressed by the expert panel included which patient should be seen via telehealth versus in person, important implementation considerations for oncology telehealth visits, establishment of the physician-patient relationship within the context of telehealth and oncology, the roles of advanced practice providers and allied health professionals in telehealth, virtual multidisciplinary cancer conferences, and the use of telehealth in cancer clinical trials. Of note, the expert panel's final recommendations are not meant to serve as a certification tool. Currently, this work has been submitted for publication and we're hoping that it'll be published before the end of this year. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to our panel discussion. Hello, I'm Dr. David Spiegel. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Sarah Cannon Research Institute and am a medical oncologist at Tennessee Oncology in Nashville, Tennessee. It's uh, really a great honor to talk uh, about telehealth and its impact in clinical research, kind of lessons from the pandemic. I only have five minutes uh, and I, I have three uh, slides I want to walk you through. Uh, and so we'll start with what I call the wins. I've been in a little bit of a baseball theme lately. So I actually theme this around run score. That's how you win games. Here are the four kind of areas to, to think about in terms of real um, kind of wins for telehealth and clinical research. Our ability to uh, avoid the, the delays of bringing people to town, whether it's a CRO or a pharmaceutical partner, all the people that are involved in selecting a study, um, kind of approving a site, and then activating a trial. Um, those those um, in-person meetings are certainly valuable, but the efficiencies gained by doing things remote allows you to open trials faster. And, and that's a huge win for patients and really for drug development. Uh, also our ability to screen patients. Uh, this is true, you know, just in clinical care. A patient, you know, before that patient decides to travel a great distance, even if it's from a rural setting to an urban setting is a challenge. And so doing as much as you can remotely to educate, explain what research is, and even, you know, decide if a patient you know, looks to be eligible based on performance status and comorbidities, things you couldn't tell just by in paper, you only could tell in person. You could now achieve uh, a lot of that by uh, seeing a patient on a screen. Um, our ability to regulate and provide oversight for trials, uh, we learned that this could all be done remotely for the most part. Um, I think, um, I hope that's a win that uh, continues going forward. Um, the, the expenses that are involved the time that's involved in bringing people on a site, all that goes away when you can, you can do things remotely. And also you improve the access to data in terms of the amount of data you can see at one time and, and your ability to get to it over and over again. And, and then our engagement of colleagues, our, our doctors around the country who are involved in research, you know, getting together on a platform that they're familiar with, understanding that you can do this at different times of the day, uh, something we used to do, but was still clunky, uh, a lot of efficiencies gained with the learnings of how to do a WebEx. I know that sounds silly, but it uh, was a real win. In terms of kind of opportunities or strikes, I would say, um, you know, the technology didn't always work. Even this could fail me right now uh, for things sometimes you don't understand, uh, whether it's lighting or bandwidth or, or something else unexpected, you still, you still can have failures in technology. As well, uh, a big surprise has been the fatigue involved. I think this applies to not just research, but um, everybody involved in research, involved in um, kind of a telehealth experience, uh, you know, there's some, there's some fatigue that, that gets generated by these, by these meetings and conferences that used to be in person, but now are, um, are kind of uh, remote and, and, and a visual experience that uh, can be draining sometimes if you're doing it time and time again every day. Um, there's no shortage or shortcut, I should say, for the, the value gain for being in a room with a patient, for being in a room with a colleague involved in um, kind of developing a trial and developing, um, you know, an understanding of the, the outcomes of that study. There, there's still, certainly no shortage for the opportunities of uh, what you can learn when you're, when you're together in person. So those were, um, those were, I guess I'd call those strikes or, or some of the downsides of only being um, kind of remote during the pandemic. And then looking ahead, I, you know, if I put this all together, you know, I think it's, it's more efficient research and lower costs. And, and I hope that those things 
improve the patient experience. You know, you're, you're improving the ability for a patient to get access to a study. You're improving the chances that that patient can remain closer to home for some of their assessments. You're lowering the cost of travel and visits for everybody. Um, and I think, I think overall, that would be a huge win going forward. I'm hoping we can embrace that and, and kind of build upon that. Um, I know that was quick. I hope that um, gave you a, kind of some flavor of the of the experience of telehealth and clinical research, but I also am looking forward to the opportunity for the uh, kind of open discussion. Thanks for your time and attention. Hi, my name is Inga Lennis, and I'm a medical oncologist and the Senior Vice President of Ambulatory Care and Patient Experience at MGH. And it's great to be with you today talking about scaling virtual care at an academic enterprise. Um, at MGH, uh, at its peak, we conducted almost 90,000 virtual visits a, a month um, at the peak of the pandemic, which is a 112-fold increase over our pre-pandemic levels. Um, six weeks into the pandemic, virtual care accounted for 83% of the ambulatory volume, up from less than 1% prior to the pandemic. And in total, we've done 700,000 virtual care visits in 2020. So really the focus of this talk is to talk about um, not only what we did, but also the tools in managing such a large enterprise. And I'm gonna end with some of the ways that we're trying to reduce disparities and the ongoing work that we have within the MGH community. When we think about scaling virtual care across a large enterprise, which includes 269 practices in 55 different locations, um, that includes cancer care, we really thought about it in three different domains. One was practice operations, uh, which is in the first part, uh, the top stripe of this um, uh, Gantt chart. And then secondly, we thought about platform and technology optimization. And thirdly, we, we think about policy and regulation, which are increasingly becoming very important. Under practice operations, we worked first on defining our virtual targets creating standardized workflows and adjusting our templates so that our schedulers could schedule appropriately in for virtual care. And then we've done a lot of local process improvement um, in support of our large amount of practices to make sure that virtual care is embedded for the future. We sustain a level of virtual care about 30% of our ambulatory visits across the enterprise continue to be telehealth visits. Um, and we're hoping that it will continue to be a major part of care at MGH. In our platform and technology optimization, we use a Zoom um, interface with our electronic health record. Um, and that was something that was established early on, but we've had to innovate, especially as the public health emergency has come to an end in this area. MGH is in the Northeast with lots of small states. We see lots of patients across borders, state borders. And so we've had to integrate um, into our electronic health record decision trees that help schedulers to pair out-of-state patients with appropriately licensed clinicians, and that's been a large effort over the last month. And then lastly, we keep an eye on policy and regulation, which are so important and will um, have great effects on the amount of virtual care we do for the future, depending on what happens in the national level. This is one of the virtual care tools that we use um, to manage uh, virtual care, care at scale. Uh, we monitor um, for operations, our virtual visits, and not only video visits, but telephone-only visits, and you see that up in the upper left-hand corner. We look at trend over time, and also we can also drill down into each department to see the amount of virtual care that's happening. On the right-hand side of this tool, you also see um, uh, health equity uh, broken down by race, ethnicity, and the use of telephone and video virtual care. This is one of the newer advances in our large enterprise dashboard that we are really proud of and that we plan to take advantage of to learn more about the disparities in these areas and to then create targeted projects um, to, uh, to remedy the disparities. We also uh, monitor patient experience and uh, listed on the left-hand side are the questions that we ask patients after every single ambulatory visit, including virtual care visits, about the quality and the experience they had it includes not only how the provider um, performed in terms of explaining things and listening carefully, et cetera, but also the connection quality, the technical support, and some of those things that are um, just only um, uh, uh, something that happens in telehealth. Our net promoter score or our likelihood to recommend is um, very high for telehealth. You see that it's um, 88.1, which is very, very high. 
91% um, of patients recommend, uh, uh, highly recommend their telehealth experience. And um, this is actually higher than our in-person ratings. So lastly, we are united as a system to address disparities in access to virtual care. We've um, innovated with um, new things that we're working on across the system, including digital access coordinators, tools in multiple languages, loaner technologies, text-based video, and early integration of um, interpreters. We also are studying the optimal deployment of virtual healthcare, not only in cancer, but across many other disciplines, looking at barriers to acceptance, community determinants of virtual care efficacy, optimal health conditions for use, pairing wearable technologies and mon uh, monitoring, and condition-specific research. And lastly, for the future, we have our eyes on our out-of-state virtual care compliance and regulatory um, uh, uh, condition, uh, considerations. And we're really uh, uh, trying to shift the conversation from reimbursement to value as we keep an eye on the possible changes to reimbursement of um, this valuable tool. Thank you to the people who've contributed to this today. And thank you for um, participating. My name is Paula Jacobson. I'll be describing several recent National Cancer Institute research initiatives designed to advance the use of telehealth for cancer care. I have no disclosures, but I do want to acknowledge the many colleagues at NCI whose activities are reflected in the work I present, including Drs. Roxanne Jensen and Robin Vanderpool. Given the many steps in developing NCI research initiatives, our principal focus has been to try to anticipate what happens next. In light of the growth of interest in and use of telehealth we've just witnessed, what should be a research agenda for telehealth and cancer care in a post-pandemic world? We believe the current situation provides an excellent opportunity to accelerate the pace of telehealth research and to expand its scope to include more of the cancer control continuum, as well as more points on the translational research continuum. It's also an opportune time to push ahead on research about how telehealth can be used to address longstanding issues in cancer care delivery, especially for underserved populations, such as rural and low-income individuals. While the first steps in our planning process was to obtain stakeholder input on scientific gaps and research needs in this area by issuing a formal request for information, or RFI. In the pie chart, you see a breakdown of the sources for the 46 responses we received. And in addition to reviewing the individual submissions, we performed a qualitative analysis that identified three major themes. The need to develop new approaches for integrating telehealth into delivery of cancer care, the importance of identifying and disseminating best practices for use of telehealth, and the need to focus on how telehealth intersects with issues of health equity and access to care. I'll add that the volume of responses suggested a strong interest in and capacity for conducting cancer-focused telehealth research. The responses to the RFI were summarized in a webinar we held in March that is archived at the web address shown at the bottom of the slide. The other action we took early on was to analyze NCI's existing portfolio of grants in this area. We identified 21 grants, most of which are investigator-initiated R01s, that were studying some form of synchronous, that is real-time, patient-clinician communication. The grants fell into one of three categories of care, supportive care, which includes symptom management, psychosocial care, and cancer prevention. And I've included some examples of each below. While these are all important topics, the list reflects a fairly specialized research focus. And what's notably missing is research on the forms of care that we saw rise dramatically during the pandemic. For example, the, the use of telehealth by the primary oncology team to deliver components of routine cancer care. So synthesizing this and other information we gathered, we concluded there's a need to encourage and support research that identifies those cancer care contexts optimally suited to the use of telehealth post-pandemic, that tests innovative approaches to combining synchronous communication with asynchronous forms of communication, such as electronic symptom monitoring, that demonstrates how telehealth might be used to reduce disparities and improve access to certain forms of care. And if we truly wanna have a major impact, research that generates scalable, transferable, and sustainable models showing how telehealth can yield better quality of care, more efficient utilization of healthcare resources, and improved health outcomes. We developed two funding opportunity announcements to support and encourage work of the type I just described. The first is a request for applications to fund centers on telehealth research and cancer-related care. NCI has set aside funds to establish up to three cancer-focused telehealth research centers in what we recognize as a changing healthcare and policy environment. These funds will allow each center to establish a research infrastructure for testing telehealth-based models of care in real-world settings. And toward that end, each center is required to identify a clinical practice network that can serve as a laboratory for this work. 
Each center is expected to conduct a large pragmatic trial designed to generate findings with broad applicability and conduct several pilot projects that will lay the groundwork for additional larger scale studies. We hope by funding these centers to accelerate the development, evaluation, and widespread dissemination of new evidence-based models of telehealth for cancer care. This RFA closed for a seat of applications on July 20th, and we expect to make awards early in 2022. At the same time, we also put out a broad program announcement in the form of the Notice of Special Interest. This announcement encourages both R01 and R21 submissions on a wide range of telehealth research topics. It includes within its scope research on both patient provider and provider to provider interactions, as well as research using synchronous and asynchronous forms of communication. The full notice can be found at the web address listed on the slide, and a webinar we recently conducted uh, providing additional details is archived at the second web address listed below. As we, as we track responses to these two funding announcements, we'll also be considering other ways to advance and support research on telehealth for cancer care. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon. Hi, my name is Bill Dayhut, and I'm a scientific director for clinical research for the Center for Cancer Research at the NCI. This is part of the NIH Clinical Center. And I want to talk today over the next five minutes about how we really change the way we practice medicine at the NIH Clinical Center due to COVID-19. First, a little about who we are. So the NCI is really part of the NIH Intramural Research Program. And NCI, as you folks know, is one of the 27 institutes and centers. And the Center for Cancer Research is one of the intramural parts of the NCI. But it's important to realize that at the NIH Clinical Center, which is the world's largest research hospital, the NCI, although we're one of the 27 institutes, are about a third of both the adjusted patient days as well as the financial consumption by the uh, NIH Clinical Center. Thus, in a lot of ways, we're similar to uh, cancer hospitals as opposed to more traditional hospitals. Some unique aspects. Every patient at the NIH Clinical Center is on a research study. We do not have an ER. Patients don't walk in for care. Patients come from every state and international. Patients are not billed for any aspect of the medical care performed at the clinical center. Third-party payers, private or government, are neither notified nor invoiced for any care at the clinical center. We're a federal institution, so physicians can be licensed in any state, although the clinical center is in Bethesda, Maryland. And care is always provided with, in partnership with the local medical team. So wonderfully, the NIH Clinical Center really developed this telehealth concierge service. There's information in here more than you need to know, but essentially we would arrange a telehealth appointment and then the NIH hospital would reach out to the patient, arrange the visit, and really arrange language interpreters and really help with communications uh, for our visit. And here's some data. This is not just cancer, this is all of NIH. But you can see back in 2020, we essentially had no telehealth appointments. And as you can see, over time, this has increased significantly so. And interestingly enough, you can see the NCI cancer patients is a large part of that. Again, we had very few patients when we started, but over time, several hundred patients a day, all on research studies, you remember, are now being seen by telehealth. So what do we learn? Well, we learned our research proposals need to be amended. We need to decrease the frequency of visits to Bethesda, which the protocols had said, and allow telehealth visits. Decrease requirements of physical examinations that we probably didn't need. And batch correlative blood work when scientifically feasible. We found that shipping of commercial agents was much easier than IND agents. And we need to facilitate ability for patients to obtain clinical or research labs outside of Bethesda. But obviously you need to work very closely with a sponsor, the IRB and the FBDA. We can't simply just make it up as we go along. And we think this may actually improve diversity of our patients. Although we cover transportation and provide a stipend for housing, the economics of traveling to Bethesda may impact certain groups disproportionately. Telehealth has the potential to lessen these burdens. It needs to be done, though, in collaboration with local institutions. And currently, we are looking critically at our protocol design, court of laboratory and biopsy schedule, as well as concierge services to ensure access to our, our clinical trials is enhanced. Further directions is really enhancing our telehealth service. And we really think by, by some of the things listed here on this page that will make this even easier for patients and really improve the ability for patients to be on our trials as well increase our diversity. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Leonard Sachs from the Office of Medical Policy, CEDAR at FDA. 
And I want to start with just a little bit of contextual background, uh, reminding ourselves of the new urgencies which we saw in COVID-19, uh, where ongoing trials were under threat. There were concerns about patient safety who were unable to visit sites. We were relying on technology that not everybody had. There were breakdowns in supply chains and there was inability to get lab tests. And in some of the trials for COVID-19, there were other challenges because they required very urgent implementation. Data was needed for many treatment options. And a lot of these considerations apply to cancer trials as well. Uh, so clearly one of the big solutions was gonna be remote data acquisition, both in uh, COVID and for cancer. Uh, I think the convenience of these types of trials are self-evident for patients who have impaired mobility, cognitive problems, or they're missing work, or have no have problems with childcare. Uh, for rare diseases, the advantages are including patients in the remote locations. We can sometimes get continuous or frequent data using technologies such as sensors, smartwatches, and tablets, and we can get some evaluation of function functionality in the real world environment. So the overarching principle here is a decentralized clinical trial, which we regard as trials where some or all related, trial related activities take place at locations that are separate from the investigator's location. And there's a list here of some of the tools that I'll go through, the use of video interactive tools and telemedicine, electronic informed consent, use of local um, imaging and uh, labs uh, facilities, the direct distribution of, patients, of drugs to patients, use of real world data from health care records, uh, trials in the healthcare setting, which are known as pragmatic trials by some, uh, the use of master protocols and remote data gathering using sensors and other technologies. Uh, with, as far as video interactive tools go, uh, it's standard in telemedicine and there's been some use in clinical trials. The concerns are obviously not being able to get uh, data we need in person, for example, physical examinations, and they may present challenges for patient retention without individual patient contact. Electronic informed consent is already published in our guidance and is very much part of uh, trials already. The use of local health care provider, local health care services, particularly of value in cancer trials, I would imagine. Uh, the use of local facilities for uh, lab tests and imaging, which are major components of the research criteria, you can also have local health care providers going to patients' homes. Uh, the risks are variability from unstandardized data from many different sources. In this setting, superiority studies are probably more convincing than non inferiority studies to show a drug effect. Uh, direct distribution of drugs to patients is something that can be done. It was done during the COVID emergency and uh, many of the state and local regulations, which are complicated, were relaxed. Uh, but investigators had to track and control the, the release of these drugs. Uh, shipping and packaging applies particularly to drugs that are sensitive to heat or temperature and they have to be safe to administer at home. Uh, I'm sure there's no need to emphasize that a lot of the data can be harvested from existing clinical data records in electronic health record systems and so on. Uh, as far as trials in the healthcare setting go, these have the advantages of using in, in existing infrastructure. They're convenient for patients, uh, helpful for long-term follow-up in cancer patients. Uh, but we have to remember that diagnosis have to be simple enough to be made in the healthcare setting, that the outcomes have to be simple to determine and reliable to capture in the healthcare setting and that trial procedures are generally part of clinical care. A word about master protocols and trial networks, very helpful for introduction of rapid new uh, investigational arms using platform trials and also for looking at different subgroups as part of basket trials and they also take advantage of inf existing infrastructure. And remote data gathering during se using sensor digital technologies, perhaps not that applicable to cancer trials, but biosensors can be used uh, such as ECGs, pulse oximetry, glucose monitors, and other sensors such as actigraphy, interactive apps, cell phone photography, etc. And they allow continuous monitoring and measurements of functionality. And they allow us to capture rare events like atrial fibrillation, for example, or seizures. They may be useful patient selection, outcome assessment, assessment and AE evaluation. And it's important to validate and verify these systems when we are relying on their data. Uh, unintended consequences will obviously learn in due course uh, which activities are reliable and which are not, which practices lead to variability or reduced quality of data, Outbreak, outdated practices will disappear and we're likely to rely much more on electronic systems. But I think it does present us with a new vision for clinical trials, both for investigators and for patients. 
And I very much look forward to the questions that uh, hopefully will follow. Thank you. So I want to really thank the National Academy for this opportunity to present today. My name is Lee Fleischer. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, as well as the Director of the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality. And from uh, telehealth, I'm also going to speak from my clinical perspective as an anesthesiologist who was practicing during the first three months of the pandemic, so practicing in that very remote setting, only actually performing cases that were absolutely necessary, and then coming into CMS a little over a year ago and really seeing how we should change our way of thinking about telehealth. So the week before the public health emergency, there were 14,000 visits. But during the mid-March through mid-September timeframe, there were 12.8 million visits or 38% of all visits were telehealth. Clearly those were E&M visits, they weren't surgery. But I think it's important to realize that it went to very high levels and now really has returned back in most places to normal but what's the right cadence for the, our patients and to achieve the best outcomes? And these are some of the key questions we're starting to ask with the data we have. We paid the same during the public health emergency for remote visits, for telehealth, and we paid at the same rate. And we know that post the public health emergency, at least in the fee-for-service program, we're going to be addressing the question of what do we, from a statute standpoint, are we able to continue? We know that mental health, we are continuing, even audio only. What can we do for ENM? What can we do for cancer care? Um, what, as opposed to what the Medicare Advantage plans can do, which they have much more flexibility, as what is the flexibility in our models? And I know that there will be another talk about that, but I'll talk about it also here. And as I think about this, it's if we were in a model, if we had the total cost of care, as I as a health services researcher and clinician think about it, what would we do for our patients to achieve the quality of care, the same outcomes, if we were able to match it? And certainly with this particular um, administration's focus on equity, and in fact this time with our important focus on what we saw in the inequities in care and where we want to, what we want to achieve, you know, does it matter the type of telehealth? Uh, do we need it over Zoom or, or some other um, where we can actually see a visual picture? Can it be done by audio only? And does it increase or decrease disparities depending on the population? So I think the, the key questions that we have to answer before we really know what are the minimum standards, what should we get to, really is we have to do some more research. Um, some we need to lean in and, and do the research literally while flying the plane from my perspective as we sort of allow certain visits, because we do that already in bundled care, and allow the clinician the opportunity. Post-op visits can be done, certainly in bundles, with you know having cancer surgery. The other question is, from my mind, how do we look at the initial visit that um, somebody may need, where they say, I'm worried about something, you may or may not need the physical exam. How do we pivot into the issue of the history, then the physical, depending again on whether or not it can be done just visually or you really need to have palpation that you need to be in person or can just go straight to uh, some you know, radiographic or, or some way of imaging for the techniques, then how can we think about, and this is even a colleague used this, using telemedicine to get second opinions or to coordinate with greater subspecialists so that 
the team can work with you and sometimes even maybe having two members of the team who may not be in the same institution coordinate with the patient to get them the best care for specific cancers that require that greater subspecialization. And finally, it's going to be important to think about that cadence of surveillance. And again, if it's imaging, that's most important. Should we think about, can we do this all through telehealth, through telemonitoring after the case? So in brief, I think CMS did see a positive uptake during the PHE. We're looking at what we can, from a regulation standpoint, based upon statute, sort of look at afterwards. And as a, a member of the NAM as, and a health services researcher, I think it's going to be really important that we provide the community as well as the policymakers what are, is the best way to achieve excellent outcomes or similar outcomes that is equal for all populations using these new modalities combined with in-person visits? Thank you. Good day. Uh, my name is Michael McNeely. I'm the director of the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth uh, within the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy at the Health Resources and Services Administration. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, telehealth has been a cutting edge delivery mechanism for healthcare that has provided much needed access to evaluation and treatment of rural and underserved populations. Telehealth provides the opportunity to be a cost effective alternative to the traditional face to face care delivery models. It's important that we have a mutual understanding of how we define telehealth. HRSA defines telehealth as the use of electronic information and telecommunication technologies to support and promote long distance healthcare, patient and professional health related education, public health and health administration. The technologies involved in telehealth include video conferencing, the internet, store and forward imaging, streaming media, terrestrial and wireless uh, communications and mobile phone use. Telehealth has an enormous benefit in our and is particularly relevant in rural and underserved communities through an increase in access to services, improved workforce development, and improved care delivery. The benefits of telehealth can be subdivided into benefits to providers, patients, and payers. The telehealth benefits for providers include improving workforce development, improving care delivery, serving more patients, and it lowers the no-show rate for patients. Uh, the telehealth benefits for patients include increasing access to care, reducing travel, and lets the patient stay in the home community. Uh, as it relates to payers, uh, it reduces the cost for transportation to allow for more timely care to produce better outcomes that save cost. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, additional benefits of telehealth were demonstrated. Uh, these include limited potential for exposure to the virus for healthcare workers, reduction in risk of exposure to the virus by persons outside the patient's home, and increases in allowable billable telehealth services. Although there are numerous benefits to telehealth, barriers to advancing telehealth remain. The five areas uh, with the biggest uh, uh, issues are reimbursement, licensure, prescribing, credentialing, and broadband. During the pandemic, uh, some of the barriers to advancing telehealth have been addressed through flexibilities, and these changes are temporary. Uh, most of these measures will sunset at the end of the public health emergency. Some of these changes include, for Medicare, geographic restrictions for patients or providers were lifted, eligible services were expanded, all healthcare providers eligible for, uh, to bill Medicare can bill for telehealth services, providers can reduce or waive patient cost sharing for telehealth visits, providers can furnish services outside the state of enrollment, and audio only uh, became allowable. Uh, for Medicaid, the coverage differs from state to state. Uh, most states have expanded Medi Medicaid coverage for telehealth, and many states now allow audio only. Uh, home is the originating site and coverage and pay parity for telehealth services. Almost every state has modified licensure requirements and renewal policies for providers, including out-of-state uh, requirements for telehealth. Uh, within OAT, 
Uh, we fund a number of programs that support the advancement of telehealth. These programs provide opportunities to build the evidence base, identifying solutions and providing resources and technical assistance to patients and providers. Uh, four programs of note within O that intersect with the delivery of care in respect to cancer diagnosis and treatment through telehealth include our telehealth technology enabled learning program, with, whose purpose is to connect specialists and academic medical centers with primary care providers to provide evidence based training and support to help in the treatment of patients with complex conditions. Uh, telehealth centers of excellence use their expertise to serve as incubators to pilot, track, and refine uh, telehealth research and practice. And our telehealth resource centers uh, who provide technical assistance, education, and resources on various topics. We have 14 of these, and 12 of them are regional, uh, with two serving as a policy and technology um, specialists. The TRCs have specializations in a number of uh, topics, including tele-OB, telegenetics, and tele-oncology. Uh, finally, uh, the Licensure and Portability Grant Program provides support for state professional licensing boards to carry out programs um, under which licensing boards of various states cooperate to develop and implement state policies that will reduce statutory and regulatory barriers to the provision of healthcare services through telehealth and technology. Additionally, uh, HHS and HRSA launched telehealth.hhs.gov in April of 2020 in response to the pandemic. This website is a one-stop resource for patients and providers for everything they need to know about telehealth, including best practices, how-to information, policy and reimbursement updates, and implementation, implementation resources. 2020 has shown us that telehealth provides significant benefits and has played a key role in reducing the disruption to healthcare services. Telehealth patient populations have expanded beyond rural and underserved areas with this adoption across a range of specialties. HRSA believes telehealth will use, uh, will continue to grow, and our goal is to continue to be a leader in the field. We continue to monitor changes to telehealth regulations and work with federal partners to build strong telehealth partnerships. Finally, know that HRSA's vision is to continue to work across HHS to leverage telehealth activities in, in order to advance the field of telehealth. We will continue to work with, uh, across HHS with CMS, NIH, ARC, CDC, and ASPR, and other departments, including FCC, NTIA, and USDA, to link across uh, programs and leverage activities. Uh, thank you for having me today. Well, thank you um, for those incredible presentations. So now we will have uh, some time for uh, panel discussion. So I invite everyone to uh, join us back. Um, so just a reminder for the audience, please um, enter your questions into the uh, box, into the uh, box that appears uh, as you're watching the uh, webinar. Um, and um, I will ask the first question. There's so many questions to ask. I don't know where to begin, but I'll start with this one. So um, telemedicine has um, the potential to improve. It also has the potential um, to exacerbate disparities um, in uh, cancer care and in cancer clinical trials. Going forward, how do we improve and not exacerbate potential disparities? And um, I think I'm going to put most of the speakers um, on the hot seat, um, but the one that I'm seeing now is um, Dr. Zahn, so maybe you can start. Great. Um, so the disparities that, that ASCO has noted, and we have just personally in our practice, is access to broadband and technology and familiarity with technology. So the value of the telehealth and the pandemic standpoint is that audio was allowed. Um, so very often we were able to use audio without an audio visual component for patients who are either inner city, okay, in other words, they couldn't come to us because they'd have transportation issues or rural. Um, most people we found did have access to audio or had neighbors who could come over and give them their phone. Audio visual, however, was much more difficult. Either they didn't have the broadband and the internet access or they didn't have the technology. Uh, to be able to do a video conferencing. So as ASCO has advocated and as we clinicians would like, of course, is increase in broadband and, and digital um, health infrastructure, which actually was led by the educators. They, they really started that, you know, when all of a sudden our school children had to be uh, educated at home. So they really were the leaders, you know, at the same time we started using telemedicine. You know, so certainly, you know, there are some of the barriers and how we overcame it 
is by using um, the audio technology. So we would advocate just from our day-to-day -day practice that we continue to have accessibility to the audio aspect of being able to deliver telehealth for those individuals that don't have access otherwise. Certainly there are some creative things that are being done you know, across the world um, as well as potentially locally and that's developing hotspots. Uh, the educators again taught us about that, at least here in our community for the areas in town that didn't have uh, infrastructure and broadband, they would take buses, school buses and had a hotspot in the school bus so that people could go to that hotspot um, and be able to, to do their education. But there, that same concept could be applied as well um, to, to neighborhoods in, in terms of where you're trying to deliver healthcare you know, in, in the face of not having access to broadband otherwise. Thank you. So um, Dr. Lennis, um, can you comment on that as well? What, what has N MGB, a large organization, done during the pandemic and what do you plan to do going forward? Sure, um, thank you. So I agree with Dr. Zahn for sure that pay parity for audio visits is incredibly important. Um, we also found some success with um, loaner technology. So access to actual um, devices that could help during this time. We also needed um, new infrastructure and many more resources for our interpreter services. So when we bring telehealth along for our actual, our providers, we also needed to consider all of the faculty, all of the staff that are interacting with our patients in person. So that's not just our, our um, healthcare providers, but they are our schedulers, our interpreters, and all of those people that are interacting with patients one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, I'd also um, say that the other really interesting thing that we're watching is the use of hubs and kiosks. So um, partnering with um, uh, some industry partners, like I am aware of programs that have partnered with um, uh, uh, our, um, our pharmacy colleagues to put access to telehealth right in our local pharmacies in the communities where patients are so that they can travel to those places and be able to access um, uh, virtual care. So those are some of the things that we're watching for the future to help to reduce disparities. Thank you. And, and then Dr. Kelly, so the VA has been doing this for a while. So I'm wondering what mechanisms you have in place and what you're planning to put into place to um, reduce disparities going forward. Yeah, so we have some of the same disparities in terms of uh, sophistication and dealing with the, the technology or even access to the technology. And then some parts of the country don't even have Wi-Fi access or data access uh, even to a cell network. Um, so there's some of the strategies that we've done have already been mentioned. Um, so obviously educating uh, the, the patient and their family. Um, we've also been doing some partnerships to establish what we call pods uh, in association with veteran service organizations and some commercial entities such as big box stores. Uh, so you can go shopping and get your telehealth visit at the same time. Um, and then loaner uh, devices, we will send the patient uh, a, um, a hotspot and a iPad uh, so that they can talk to us and then and there'll be some follow-up communications on how to use that. So pretty much parallel a lot of those. Um, it, I think it sort of uh, emphasizes the the disparity that is uh, underlying our society is, is that there isn't uh, access to broadband uh, internet or even any internet in some parts of the country. And that is a disparity that impacts not only healthcare, but every other aspect of, of our life. Great. Maybe so I who, could, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, maybe I can follow up a little bit on this one. So we've heard a lot about the disparities created by lack of Wi-Fi. But then if you take that on a little bit further and then you're in an urban setting, like, like here in Philadelphia where there's ample Wi-Fi, it's the case that as we at Jefferson Health escalated our telehealth usage, understanding we were already licensed to do it and already doing it. Our big challenge was actually in digital literacy um, of everyone having a smartphone, but not using it like a smartphone, not knowing how to download apps, and frequently not having an email address. So we had to deploy our social workers to use FaceTime to actually get people to learn how to set up a Gmail account so we could actually do a telehealth visit. So there was a significant amount of time, effort, and resource that had to be devoted to that. So I'm wondering if there was, from our panelists who escalated in telehealth, anyone, did you have a similar experience? Did you have an alternative solution outside what we did, which was really a quick Band-Aid? So, so we, we actually did in the VA, we have that same experience. So sophistication of the, of the patient is a really a big, a big uh, challenge. 
So we did overcome the email issue. So some patients didn't have email addresses and our technology originally required an email address, uh, but they made a modification to the technology. So now you just need a cell phone number and you can uh, basically do FaceTime uh, through our, our platform uh, with just knowing the, the email address, sorry, the, uh, the cell phone number. So that's one approach uh, that I think could be available. Dr. Lenas, did your system, since you escalated so much, was there, there's, or Dr. Dayhut, you know, is there, what did you use to get over the digital, digital literacy divide? We found that texting, just as Dr. Kelly mentioned, was, was a huge key. Lots of people use texting. So having a text into the portal, our virtual care system relies on our patient portal, which is, can be tough. Um, so creating a workaround for that that can work from a, tr from a text message directly into the system, and then also having a second system. So we use a primary, a primary embedded system within our EHR, but then we also have trained our providers on a secondary system that doesn't rely on that. So um, we actually have a backup system that we use um, that is approved and also compliant in terms of safety for um, uh, uh, medical information. And that was really important because that gave us some alternatives to use for patients um, who couldn't navigate the, the initial system. So Karen, obviously our numbers are smaller, but, but obviously they're all clinical research patients. So we actually had what they called a concierge service, would actually call the patient the day before and, and sort of walk, walk through the technology with them, make sure they could connect and sort of do it step by step. So by the time of the patient visit, you know, by and large, the patients were up to speed to what could be done. And so, again, that wouldn't work everywhere, but that is something for clinical trials, potentially, that folks may want to sort of integrate, you know, as you're, you know, you're working with your sponsors. The other thing that I, I liked about telehealth was, is that allowed us to bring in family members from different geographic locations much easier. So, Again, you know, we had, with people that were flying to Bethesda normally, now I could see the patient virtually in Arkansas, but their daughter or son in California could be on the call too. And so that for particularly patients whose literacy about, you know, complex clinical trials was not, you know, ideal, having a family member who may be more in tune with what's going on, I think is, is particularly helpful too. And yeah. just to say from the federal perspective, you know, it, it's complicated. And Karen, I live in Philadelphia too. And just go midweek, but you know, we what we've got right now is the fact that the PHE is still a, a federal uh, PHE. So therefore, we have our um, uh, allowances under the federal PHE, but the states are actually terminating their federal PHE. So I get calls from family friends all the time saying, "You're stopping telehealth." across state lines and it's like I can't do anything from a federal perspective. So I think there's a lot of discussions um, federally about these sort of issues and, and what will happen when we terminate the PHA um, and therefore the flexibilities go away. Yeah, that, that's my new role. So, you know, speaking now as the CEO of American Cancer Society and ACS CAN, our, our advocacy group is, is attuned to this and really uh, hoping to help at the, at the local and state level. But, you know, from the disparities perspective, I think it's important for us to think just beyond Wi-Fi, that if Wi-Fi wi were plentiful, what you're hearing from this group is there are a significant number of additional barriers that will have to be addressed in order to truly enhance access to telehealth, you know, across the, uh, across all areas demo and demographics. I would add that it's also the affordability of Wi-Fi uh, for many people, including people in urban settings where Wi-Fi might be plentiful, but they can't afford a, a plan. Yeah. And right, the, the value of asynchrony. Or some. Yeah, so these are these are all really important points. And I think since we already touched on, um, you know, some of the additional barriers, you know, I'm wondering if the group can expand upon the other barriers, which specifically licensure um, and insurance coverage. Um, so who would like to take this one on first? If not, I will call on someone. Well, so Dr. Kelly, again, as the VA, right, you probably have the most flexibility um, on both accounts. So is there anything that you can tell us that can help us that are not 
um, working in the VA type setting. You can all work in the VA. That would solve the problem. <laughs> uh, and, and that would be a great solution. We, we could actually have the NCI VA DOD consortium. You can all join us. Um, I, I think if you look at the, the quality of medical care that's delivered in the cancer center, at the, the NCI clinical center, uh, at the, in the VA and the DOD, uh, there's really not an issue of, of uh, I'm licensed in Michigan and not in Ohio, and therefore my quality of care is better. So it's not really clear to me why there can't be cross-state licensure other than the, the um, I guess maybe the constitution or the way the country came about, but practically the quality of care should be exactly the same. So that's the model we use, uh, just like Bill mentioned for uh, the NIH is that you need one uh, license in some state um, and that's enough. Um, and then in terms of the billing, uh, as you know, uh, VA provides its own coverage. Uh, we do bill second um, uh, party insurers uh, if the patient has a non-federal uh, government uh, insurance, we will bill them, um, but we don't really make decisions based on whether the patient has that coverage or not, uh, since it's a small minority of patients that actually do. Um, so we don't really have that issue. So I guess the other solution would be a uh, single uh, party payer, uh, uh, Medicare for all, um, you know, and now, now you're getting into deep territory, Dr. <laughs> yeah, Kelly. Yeah, I, I know you're but, you know, I think, I think all of us who have, you know, who have run centers that uh, are, you know, have the border states have run into the technical hurdle, the time constraint, the cost of getting licensed in multiple states. So I think that's, you know, something that we're all hearing as a consensus here is let's see what we can do to eliminate that barrier and what would have to be done in order to achieve that. And, and I think that was a, a question that was posed earlier is, is okay, great, it's a great idea. Uh, what are the downsides, uh, and how do you, how would you make that happen? Is it a federal? Uh, would you have to have the states uh, agree with each other? So can New Jersey and Pennsylvania and, and maybe Delaware agree to have cross-state licensure? Are there other uh, professional licensure situations where that is already happening? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, this might be something for our, our state uh, medical societies to, uh, to get into or our professional um, societies in oncology. So I know that Dr. Uh, Zahn wanted to. Oh, yeah. Oh, Dr. Yep. So Dr. Zahn wanted to respond to that. I just saw. Sure. Sure. There's a, a couple comments I'd make. You know. So prior to the pandemic, of course, um, uh, we like for our, our our locations, for example, we take care of, of patients uh, in Indiana, but also Michigan and Illinois because our practices are right across the state border. We only had to be licensed in the state of Indiana if the patient came to us. However, many of us had licensures in other states, so we could do simple things like prescribe controlled substances for our patients in the state of Michigan. But when the pandemic hit, you had to have the ability to be licensed to be able to counsel that patient where they lived. So for my page, so my colleagues who were licensed in the state of Michigan, they could counsel our patients who were in Michigan by telemedicine, but I was only licensed in Indiana. So I could not counsel my patients who are in the state of Michigan unless they went across the McDonald's across the state line and they were sitting in Indiana at the time that I counseled them. So that being said, you know, uh, as somebody had mentioned, you know, each state has their, um, their own particular specifics when it comes to physician licensure. And it impacts a lot of things. It impacts your DEA and how you get your DEA number, your pay medicine requirements. It, it impacts your medical malpractice insurance as well as the medical practice process. So that's very state specific. So when it comes to the licensure, uh, licensure issue, as you know, there's the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which was launched in 2017. And in fact, is a voluntary pathway for licensure physicians wanting to practice in medical states, but it's voluntary. It's not a federal mandate. So there's only so many states that are participating in it and it does not include Indiana. So for our particular practice, my colleagues were able to take advantage of counseling patients in Michigan or Illinois if they had a state license or I had to go ahead and get a license for Michigan, for example. So right now we do in fact have this uh, contact available and, and ASCO Advocacy has been encouraging state legislators to go to the state to allow for that IMLC, which is a short version of Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, to be available for their physicians. Now there's some pushback from that. Not all physicians are in agreement with that. They're concerned about unfair competition um, or they're concerned about other issues. For example, if you have a patient that's um, your patient and somebody comes in from Oregon, I'm just gonna pick on Oregon, and uh, they start taking care of my patient and then 
somehow they 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 make some decision. That patient comes to me, and there's some fall. There's some uh, issues with that. You know, what position does that put me in? Um, I'm saying this is what I've been told by my colleagues, and so there are some concerns, you know, about competition when you follow that interstate medical licensure compact. But it has been in place even before the pandemic. Great. Thank you, and and Dr. McNeely, can you comment on this as well? Yeah, no, I was going to comment on on the on the IML, uh, IMLC, uh, honestly. Uh, there are 33 member states in that, two territory, uh, DC and Guam are also part of it. A big part of that though is that, you know, it is voluntary. These are state decisions. It happens at, at the state legislatures. Um, and that's why it won't be a federal um, interaction, to be honest, because this goes into the state's rights issues, all right? And how they determine how Medicare is going to be distributed in their, in their states. The other part of that is that telehealth in itself is geographically restricted um, by, by law. Uh, it can only be done in, in rural areas at, at the moment. And until that changes and that legislation changes outside of the PHE, um, it won't expand as fast as, as we want it to. Um, and that, that's a big issue there. And, you know, it's one of the things we've battled in, in pro, on the program side of things uh, because we are limited in to where our services can be provided. You know, they can, uh, an urban area can provide the services, but it has to be delivered in a service area that's outside. Um, Indiana is a good example of being a state in the compact, or not in the compact, that, but is surrounded by states that are in the compact. And so if the service was to be done in Illinois, they could serve Michigan pretty easily because of the compact the situation. And there are probably, uh, I've lost track of, of how many other compacts there are in play currently. Um, there's seven to eight more that are between the nursing compact, um, SIPAC, um, and the phys physical therapist compact. There, there's a number of things that are in play now to try to advance that licensure issue. Um, I don't know that the federal government or Congress wants to take on um, a national licensure uh, initiative. I don't know that there's there's a that they have the fight in them right now uh, with everything else that's going on when it comes to it. Uh, so they will probably push the compact route because it, it has been expanding. Uh, you know, I mentioned that there's 33 states that are involved. The most recent one just started this month, um, and that was um, Ohio. Um, and so it's just. The, the fact that we have the opportunity to, you know, educate state legislatures and get them to understand why it's important to be a part of the compact, we have an opportunity there. Um, our programs actually fund um, the Federation of Medical, uh, State Medical Boards uh, for the compact uh, for, the, for ILMMC, uh, but we also um, work in other uh, portability issues. So that's really helpful. So, so maybe we can shift gears a little bit. So we, you know, we've talked about the positives of telehealth. It's here to stay. There are a number of benefits we already outlined. We outlined barriers at the level of the financial model that surrounds oncology and the complexity of uh, the logistics of, of pulling off telehealth. We identified barriers from the component of the patient and digital literacy, access to Wi-Fi, et cetera. Let's talk about some other ways and push on how we might improve. So there's a question actually from the public chat from, from Jamie Weiner from the Oncology Nursing Society asking, is there a future consideration for including nurse-led RN interventions for coordination of care, symptom management via telehealth in value-based care payments? So let's, let's go there. But, but in value-based care payment, you know, depending on the model, it, it doesn't have to follow our fee-for-service rules. So there it's going to be a lot about the states and what you're actually practicing as opposed to you know, the approach that we would take in the traditional Part A's and Part B fee-for-service model. Okay, so what's that's really helpful. What's been done from the groups that are here on the panel already? How are you employing nurse-led components of telehealth, or are you? We, I'll just, Karen, I'll take a stab at that, David Please. Spiegel. So we, you know, we're in a large 
community based practice in Middle Tennessee. So we have a whole palliative care team that connects with our patients through telehealth. And so I can have a visit in person or via telehealth and then set up a, a palliative care visit that can happen remotely. Um, in fact, much more easily than if it was in person. So we use them pretty frequently. So can I follow up on that? How was that received by the patient to have a palliative care visit by telehealth? I think it's, uh, you know, my experience has been they never really always understood why they would see another person at the appointment with me. Uh, they didn't quite understand that flow. And so this becomes a distinct appointment that uh, I think they can focus on, know that's coming up and separate from the visit with me around chemotherapy, et cetera. I, I don't know, I can't speak for all patients, but I think it's been well received. Any others like to comment on the role of, of APPs or RNs in the process? So, so I'd like to make one comment. Um, so there's something called triage pathways uh, that many community sites have adopted you know, across the country. Um, we have not uh, specifically used um, our RNs um, in a telehealth capacity, but we do, have tele we do have local triage pathways. But there are other triage pathway groups that are actually using that for telemedicine in larger groups. Uh, where in fact they have the, the nurse and oftentimes it may be a PA or an NP that's directing and driving that, that triage pathway. And they've been very happy with that. They've been able to show already reduction, even pre-pandemic reduction in ER visits and hospital stays. Okay, hey, Dr. Hey. Lennis, what about you? Yes, we're incorporating many different nurse-led uh, initiatives in telehealth, including post-discharge visits uh, with our RN and APPs. Um, like Dr. Spiegel, palliative care is using um, this. And then our pharmacy colleagues, our pharmacy colleagues who join us for certain reconciliation efforts, med reconciliation, chemotherapy, teaching visits. Um, we've been using some telehealth features for those um, since the pandemic started to really good effect. Great patient experience numbers. When we look at the satisfaction with these types of visits, it's convenient for patients. Um, uh, they save on parking. They're able to pull their family in to be able to hear the chemo teach at the same time. We find them very effective and our uh, researchers that are doing health services research are also finding that these are great opportunities, especially when you pair them with wearables. So there are some studies that we have going on where we're not only using telehealth visits with these expanded role groups, but also using some wearables to collect some actual objective data during this time as well. So a lot of great things for the future, I think. Okay, so we're hearing about the incorporation of other practitioners, incorporation of wearables. What else are we missing that can improve the quality of telehealth? Well, you know, the interesting question, um, if you listen to Liz Fowler, my colleague who oversees the Innovation Center, and uh, care coordination is gonna be one of the big themes that will come out of the Innovation Center as they redesign their approach to models. And the interesting question is, for some people, and they, they think a lot about primary care, but as a specialist and, and working still in an academic medical center, oncologists for some people are their primary care providers in coordination with, um, as you've been describing, you know, the nursing teams and you look at um, what was uh, actually delayed for two years, some of the care coordination codes for physicians. So I think that, you know, one of the key questions will be, how do you, if their primary problem is oncology, you know, how do you stand up as part of that primary care mm -hmm. or that, that care coordination as opposed to saying it must be a primary care provider? Agreed. I wanted to follow up on that last comment actually. And, um, you know, so care, care coordination and communication among healthcare providers has been noted as a major challenge, especially for oncology patients who often have multiple, multiple healthcare providers. So I'm wondering if one of the potential venues for telehealth is actually to use it for sort of a, a modified tumor board session, but really not focusing on the treatment plan, but really focusing um, on the overall care of the patient. So I'm wondering if anybody can comment on that as well. So, so we've done that actually, um, and because we have, we again have the luxury of not having to worry about reimbursement. But for sort of our, our, our new high risk patients in our prostate clinic, we're able to bring in basically do 
a multidisciplinary clinic where we, we show the images for the MRI, we go over the pathology, uh, we have the urologist, the radiation oncologist, and medical oncologist there, but we do it within a very fixed time period. So we don't let this sort of go on for hours and hours as it could, and then have the patient then follow up with individual practitioners about very specific sort of detailed medical questions about their specialty. And uh, it's actually worked well, and I think we've all learned from the other specialists. Um, it takes coordination, and I think that's something you can do in telehealth maybe a little bit better because you can sort of get on a folks calendar in advance and it's sort of locked in as opposed to, you know, come by after seeing them in clinic. But, but I, I think it's, again, bringing folks together from different specialties works. And I think putting a, a time limit on it, I think becomes important because otherwise in, in uh, telehealth, it, it can sort of drift sort of endlessly. So at least that's been, we've had a very positive experience with it. And Dr. Zahn, I see you're raising your hand. So, you know, we uh, have been doing two to three uh, tumor boards, we call them tumor boards or multidisciplinary conferences um, a week for years. So as soon as the pandemic hit, we very quickly converted into to telehealth with Zoom. Now, um, the difference was is that uh, when we were in person, we would invite the patient and the family, if they chose to, to come and attend. Um, we did not do it with the Zoom. The Zoom still had all the same specials. We had uh, radiology, pathology, all the disciplines involved, and we followed exactly the same structure as we had previously. Um, and then at the end, I would then, for example, my patients, I would just discuss with them later that day, just as I would in, in person, uh, and tell them what the tumor board conference discussion was about their case and what the recommendations were. So we just migrated to telehealth, quote unquote, but we didn't charge. There was no billing issues. We, we didn't charge even in person prior to that. Uh, the only charge was the face-to-face -face visit that I had with that patient or a telehealth audio or audiovisual conference I would have that, with that patient afterwards. And I think many of my colleagues across the country and community sites are doing exactly the same thing. Uh, if I could add too, there's a, there's a model for this in collaborative care, uh, which should work out in mental health, in which perhaps you have a psychiatrist at a central location who's working with uh, uh, providers at multiple clinics who may have some limited training in mental health issues, but for provider to provider communications is making sure the patients are prescribed the right medication or adhering to their treatment, et cetera. And, and this model really needs to be adapted for telehealth and extended to other specialties as well. So I actually just want to expand a little bit more about um, the patients and, and bring the patients back uh, back here. So um, one comment from uh, Dr. Um, Paul Kutz was about, um, you know, what have we heard from the patients in terms of what has and has not worked? You know, the other piece, I think, is that um, we heard earlier from um, um, Shelley Fault Lasso you know, saying that while patients really enjoyed telemedicine visits, they really wanted to come back to in-person visits. So as we think about the plan going forward, and I think this can go, um, this can pertain to the clinical care and also to the research perspective as well, um, who makes the decision? You know, assuming we have, we don't have the regulation issues, assuming we don't have the, you know, the Wi-Fi issues, right? Like all of that has been solved. Um, how and who makes the decision as to which patients and for what circumstances somebody should be um, brought in for a visit and um, or somebody should have a telemedicine visit. Um, so Paul, you're still on my camera, so maybe you can start sort of bringing in from the kind of the research perspective. Sure, sure. So, you know, um, certainly patient preference should factor into this, uh, but we also have to think of issues of efficiency and, and utilization of scarce healthcare resources. So I think it's probably a combination of the two. And that's why we need some more research as to what kind of uh, situations and circumstances really do lend themselves to telehealth and which patients are most likely to benefit. So I think it's gonna be a combination of uh, uh, patient characteristics as well as clinical situation that will really be the driving factor aside from policy issues and reimbursement. Paul, if you, I know the NCI is going to fund those. What's what's the anticipated number of centers that will get funded through that new RFA, and when might we re expect some of those data to report out? Sure. So uh, there's funds set aside to fund three centers, and uh, the applications were due last Friday, and we think that uh, we'll go to the Board of Scientific Advisors uh, early in 2022. Uh, and we really envision these centers as uh, you know engaging in multiple projects and having multiple collaborators. And each of them is going to have a clinical practice network, as I said, that'll be the laboratory for doing this. We recognize that uh, they'll need to function within a changing healthcare and policy environment. 
uh, but we think that that's doable. And we think these centers can really lead the nation in, in identifying those kinds of models which really need to be rolled out and disseminated more widely. Looks like Dr. Spiegel wanted to say something. No, no, I didn't have anything to add to that. But Dr. Um, Lennis, you had a very high net promoter score, right? From your patients. So was that across the board? What types of visits were really highly valued? I know it's early data, but really highly valued since you actually have the collection. So the kind of value, the, the visits that are highly valued are the more transactional visits and the ones that are more simple, I would say. You know, the, um, I think on the, the complex, the only exception is complex visits where we're involving multiple family members across the country, I would say. So it's sort of dichotomized into those two types of visits where telehealth was really appreciated. I think, though, we're going to see a future where it's always not one or the other. I mean, if you think about our work environments right now, can you imagine a time where we have in-person visits with patients but telehealth walls where we're able to bring in family members from across the country seamlessly. So, you know, my hope is that these things really merge and that we're able to, like Dr. Jacobson said, meet the patient where they are um, and apply the technology that's necessary to give them the best care. And sometimes for some of our patients, having a quick check-in with one of our nursing colleagues or our APPs, avoiding paying for parking and sitting through traffic it's best to do that via telehealth and we can do a great job that way. So I think um, uh, you know, that's what we're really seeing in the data is that um, the quick transactional visits are very highly rated and then the very complex visits that might require many providers or multiple family members are very highly rated. Dr. Zahn, we'll give you the last word. Uh, sure, so I just wanna remind everybody the expert panel recommendations are in press and uh, that in fact was one of the areas that we addressed is when uh, in-person visits would be more appropriate uh, than telehealth. But as stated earlier, it's always patient preference. Uh, it should dictate whether it's in-person or telehealth, but I can speak to personal experience and, uh, and, and what I've heard from other folks across the country is that there are times when telehealth is, is very appropriate. We find that our no-show rate has gone down tremendously because we've offered telehealth visits for follow-up of new medication starts, for example. So, and we've actually been able to intercede and intervene to be able to reduce toxicities and manage those much more effectively. So that's just an example of a benefit of telehealth ongoing even after the pandemic. Yeah, without question. I know we're almost at time here, but I expect that we'll uncover some of these, um, you know, more data from Dr. Jacobson's efforts at the NCI and funding those centers, but also the impact on providers, uh, at, which will be a component of that as well, which is a really important thing we didn't get a chance to talk about today. Um, so I'd like to just give our keynote, Dr. Kelly, just a, a few, uh, a moment for a few closing words, since you have most experience with telehealth here and having done it at the VA for so long. Thanks. Uh, so, no, I think the experience of the VA hopefully gives hope uh, for long-term um, utilization of uh, really the, the facility of using uh, whatever means of communication with the patient, patient wants and are effective. And the barriers that we're talking about are all human-made. They're not uh, inherent in anything uh, that uh, can't be mutated. So uh, I would encourage uh, the uh, regulators and all of you uh, to continue uh, to push this out to your patients. Um, and, and obviously uh, that is going to be dependent upon uh, the uh, shared interests of colleagues and regulators. Um, anyway, so I think, I think that the future looks bright, I think in terms of uh, moving uh, medicine into a different environment where uh, competition is no longer um, I guess, uh, regulated by geography. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much for giving us your experiences and the hope also for Dr. Dayhut, you know, in terms of being able to enroll patients on trial using this important mechanism as too, without the barriers of licensure and some of the things the rest of us face. So I'd like to thank all of the panelists and my co-chair for a really wonderful session. And I think this is where we give it back over to Dr. Shilsky for a wrap up of this really wonderful first day. Yeah, thank you very much, Karen and, and Larissa. What a great uh, session. So um, this does bring us to the conclusion of day one of our workshop. I wanna thank everyone who's been attending for all or parts of it. Um, and uh, I think that the speakers today were terrific, but really the discussions were very rich and, and uh, 
in particular, the discussion you just heard in this last uh, panel that surfaced a number of issues and to some extent um, <clears throat> go back to the comment that Larry Shulman made early in the day about the fragmentary nature of the US healthcare system. And you know, I think this is a great example of how um, having um, medical licensure uh, regulated by each state individually uh, is really uh, potentially you know, a barrier to patients receiving um, you know, adequate care in the most efficient way. Um, so clearly something that needs to be addressed further. Um, tomorrow, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're gonna pivot a little bit and begin to focus less on the experience of the pandemic and more on um, you know, what uh, cancer care and research should look like uh, going forward uh, and informed by our experiences during the pandemic. I invite you all to come back tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time for the second part of the workshop. Uh, for now, thank you all for listening. Have a great evening, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.